Hello everyone, it's time to talk about art again. This is the last fruit person I did, and it's a great example of something which I kind of skipped over earlier, of extracting shapes from the references. So as you can see, I actually just drew straight over the reference images, uh, took out the interesting textures and stuff, and then just kind of compiled them as like a little palette that I could then draw from. So I then start to go into like working out what kind of rough design, like the overall shape, and where I'll uh, use these textures throughout the character. In a sense, I want it to be kind of like a, a paint-by-numbers kind of thing, where to keep it feeling clean and easily understood, the, you know, the, the places which reference different textures are kind of distinct areas within the character. And then I can also make sure that they're appealing relative sizes, so that middle chunk, those little triangle shapes, they're the largest shapes of the soft velvety texture and then I kind of have a medium amount of that spiky stuff on the outside and then a smaller pit where I'm just uh, drawing from those individual spikes for the legs and the hair and then I tried you know this is a great way to then see how you can go for an alternative type of character so in this case I had the velvet on the outside and spikes the little sort of fluffy spike bits um, underneath almost like the inside lining of a piece of clothing so for the next character flip it around. Uh, instead it's got like the, the smooth velvety stuff on the inside and the big shoulder pads are a very outward shape where it mimics far more closely the actual shape of the original object. Where all of this spiky fluffy stuff is poking outwards. And then like with both of them having extracted the shape of the chestnut itself, well obviously that's going to be the head. It just feels the most appropriate because it's already that sort of dimension. So yeah, like uh, this is something I actually did for the other fruit characters, but I think I kind of whizzed over that stuff too quickly in the process video. You may be able to see it, but it's uh, it's a little less clear and I don't think I talked about it. But this is a great way to find interesting stuff within um, within the references you, you gather. And if you're feeling like you're stuck at the beginning of, of a design, if I've gathered reference and you're kind of struggling with that blank canvas syndrome, then this is a great way to have something to start working with. It's a sort of like photo bashing, like taking images and sort of bashing them together until you start to see a shape within that that you want to turn into a character or whatever design it is. Except you take away a much, much more information. The problem with photo bashing is that a lot of the time it can feel overwhelming with how much stuff is going on. You're immediately tackling with, uh, with color and light and um, and values. So when you're just trying to work out a design, a shape, a mood, that kind of thing, then having all this information piled up on top is actually very distracting. So boiling it down to literally just shape or almost texture and then sort of essentially bashing with those those elements. Um, it's a great way to avoid the problem of being overwhelmed by like an over abundance of information. So yeah, you can see like in this case I immediately had an idea that I could start running with and at this point the the problem of not knowing where to go and where to start has been alleviated completely and I'm already starting to go on like bizarre tangents so you know, <laughs> the idea of Nutcracker being a weapon um, and then just exploring potentially how that sort of thing would work like uh, swinging it around having it open up and then clasp an enemy in between the jaws that kind of thing. So it's sort of like a great catalyst to to work out what you want to create. And you can see I've, I can now just, in the same way, warp all of these um, elements that I'm drawing on the side straight into my sketches. Um, in the same way, it's sort of photo bashing. Like it's that technique. It's using the same tools and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not bringing too much information in. Um, I'm not like thinking, I want a nutcracker there. Let's find a photo of it and drop that in. Because of course that's going to look bizarre next to the the very sketchy and loose uh, concept I've done before. But it's still so much faster, like rather than trying to redraw and get the perspective right on that nutcracker weapon, I can just warp it into place, and all of that information is uh is preserved. So I think this is actually where I start to sketch out the the character I eventually chose to to render up. The interesting thing is that. A lot of the time I find, despite knowing that you know you should 
push for uh, expanding on the number of ideas you have for a certain topic. Because typically the the first design you you make isn't going to be the best one. It's like too early in the process, so you haven't actually explored all of the potential. Um, I, I find that I do get attached to the first thing I draw a lot of the time. Because typically with something like this, I'm going into this exercise with an idea in my head already. So I have a vision of what I want to design. And then I just go and execute it immediately. And as I draw, and you'll see here, like I started off with the shape of the shoulders and I've changed it completely now. Um, I'm editing everything as I go. And so I'm kind of going through iterations just without saving them out. Um, you know, if I sort of save the stages of this, then sure, I could have like a lineup showing the, the variations of the shoulder pads, but um, at least when I'm doing personal work, that's just not necessary. I can just remove the stuff that I know isn't working and then and keep going forward with it. It's actually something which I am aware of in like character lineups and stuff where for portfolio work where you want to show the variation in design and stuff. Um, I'll see like very minimal changes to a design. So imagine this character copied out over and over with maybe sort of different sized headpieces, um, changes to the wand, things like that. And at an early stage when you're concepting, um, the thing that I think is far more valuable to see is the kind of variety that I have on this page at the moment. So the sort of big buff masculine nutcracker, um, this more fairy-like um, uh, lady, and then in the top left you could see that sort of far more stylized and creature-like um, design. And this, these are all very, very distinct. They sort of, they feel like they fill different roles. They draw on different aspects of the original, uh, original reference. And in general, like, there's a lot more value here because you can imagine all the different directions you want to take it in. And certainly if you're, you're thinking in terms of how this is useful to a client, well, a lot of the time, uh, concepting is about showing the client what they don't want. So they'll give you a brief and they'll sort of be like, you know, I want to see X, Y, and Z. And um, the, the thought in their mind will always be, oh, but what happens if you tried this other thing? And until they've seen it and can you know see it to say okay this is not what we were thinking this is not what we want the it's going to sort of remain a, a what if in their head and i think uh a lot of the time we kind of forget that you know you've literally trained yourself uh to be able to pre-visualize this kind of stuff because you have to be able to draw it but being able to pre-visualize it means that a lot of the time you can say that you know uh having say that the large chunks of the outer shell of the chestnut as footwear would probably look very silly because the feet would just be big and clunky flop around and wouldn't really be the obvious place to put the biggest shape in a character design like this but you can imagine that and that's because you're like a, a professional creative but a client um, certainly isn't thinking in the same way and a lot of the time yeah the whole point is that you need to show them what they don't want. You can try your best to make it look good, and oftentimes this is why pushing to get more variation at the beginning of a, a design is great, because you may surprise yourself um, and find like an interesting solution to a problem that didn't immediately come to your head at first. But I do find that a lot of the time it's the first idea I have. It seems like the most suitable way to use a reference like this. Um, like I think this character sort of now looking back at it again, it fits what I'm trying to describe of being the most logical uh, use of the the reference, at least to me. And this is the fun thing, like imagine if someone else took the same reference and designed a something which is similar in terms of the brief, you know, like a, a, a fairy creature based on a chestnut they would have a different take on what seemed like the obvious way to use all of the elements of the reference. But for me, it was like, well, the chestnut inside is obviously going to be the head. Um, and then because it's the head has basically already got this like armor, almost like these really, really large collar, collar pieces. Well, 
I'll just make that into a, a big headpiece. And it kind of just extrapolates out from there. Anyway, you can see that I'm now just a... Uh, because I have chosen these distinct areas in the character design uh, to, to reference each of the materials of the reference, um, I can just photo bash them in to get like a real rough start as to um, what my colors will look like uh, and kind of get an idea of the balance of these textures against each other. Because something that makes them really distinct is how shiny or how noisy um, they are relative to each other. And obviously I can then use that detail density and that potential for um, contrast. So, you know, something like the, the shiny nut in the middle. There's the potential to have a really nice bright highlight next to a dark saturated color. So that's going to draw attention. And it would make sense to put that somewhere that's I want the eye to be drawn to versus something like the feet, for example, which you can see here I haven't even put any information in for because um, I know that it's not as important. I need to put something in there that's almost like a placeholder that feels believable but doesn't actually draw attention away from the areas I want you to look at. Um, meanwhile, up by the head, um, head and torso, like that's clearly the focal point. Um, it's got the most density of detail but also um, the largest value changes and like the brightest colors. So again, like without having to go through and start trying to paint in some of these things, that's a, that is a great use of uh, Photobash, is to plan out roughly how the read of a design will be. And so you can see here, like I'm deciding that um, to balance out this abundance of the, uh, the spiky stuff on top, I'm putting a thin trim down at the bottom. And so even just in terms of colors, um, the only place that really features that bright green is at the top. And so I want to make sure that it's balanced out slightly at the bottom. And the, the dress actually does that uh, in reverse. So the, uh, you've got like this abundance of the, the yellowy velvet material at the bottom, and then the small section of it up at the top. And these kind of relationships, they're not overly important. Like um, you don't have to have a setup of uh, materials that mirror each other, but flipped, things like that. Um, but instead, you just got to make sure that you feel like nothing is really standing out as out of place. So it's not obviously um, distinct in only one area and then lacking from another. Because a lot of the time when you introduce like a bright color to a design, um, it can feel very out of place or unnatural unless it's referenced somewhere else. And so I'm very much doing the same thing here, obviously with color, but with the materials as well. And then, like I did in the other fruit people, um, I'm just doing the standard, like splitting out uh, two layers, one for where the light hits and one where the, the shadow is. In this one in particular, I found that I really liked how the, the pale inside of the, uh, or it's not the inside, it's like the top of the conquer. Because I'm using both, um, uh, materials from conkers and the chestnuts. The conker has that that large white section, which is presumably where it where it grows. Um, and I use that for the the skin of the arms, and it transitions into into the face. And the way that that because it was basically colorless, like it was it was very close to gray. The original material it meant I could really play up the contrast between the shadow and the light. So you can see how I've I've made it dark and far more blue especially underneath that rough and then um, where the light peeks up onto the arms suddenly becomes this really bright warm hit and that contrast was just very appealing to me and uh, something that I've, I've been noticing more and more is that cast shadows are sort of the most important thing to give your piece dimensionality and so as you can see here um, I wanted to play that up almost as far as I could um, so the entirety of the upper arms are in shadow. And so you, you really see um, the exact point where the light uh, hits the arm again. And because of that, because of how large that chunk is, um, we get a much uh, better feeling of how big and expansive the rough above is. 
look as if much more of the arm was uh, actually in direct light, then there's no way the rough would be as big or as impressive as it is. So even if it doesn't take up as much space visually on the screen, um, we get a sense for its scale just because of how it affects the lighting. And I think that's why cast shadows end up being so important when you're designing characters, um, because they communicate the volumes that um, either basically can't be fully appreciated by seeing a character from only one angle, or uh, you know, are simply just um, not set in the perspective of the scene in a way that um, clearly shows their their shape. You know, for these, because they're all very organic uh, shapes, I can't like clearly show a foreshortened uh, front and back end in the same way that I could do that with like a box. Um, and so in this case, yeah, I want to use pretty much every other tool I have at my disposal to communicate the shape and size of it. Um, anyway, I don't actually have the rest of the rendering stage for that, but it's very, very similar to the stuff that I did for the fruit people earlier. Um, and I shall link the, the finished product in the description. Anyway, it's late, but I've been meaning to do this recording for a very long time, so I figured that I would just force myself to sit down and do it, and hopefully it's decent. But I shall see you in the next video. Farewell, bye-bye.